Kia ora tato. Welcome everyone to this meeting. So welcome to councillors, to staff, to the public, the community and uh, to the media. Uh, our, our opening prayer today is being led by Father Michael Dooley of the Green Island and Mosgill Catholic Parish. Welcome Father. Let us pray and take a moment of quiet reflection before this meeting. Eti Atui, eternal God, bless us, your people, as we gather today. As we meet as a city council, we pray that you will guide us, open our hearts and minds, helping us to see you in each other and in the world around us. And all that is discussed around this council table, give us tolerance, understanding and insight to see that justice is achieved for the benefit of all our citizens. We keep in our thoughts and prayers our brothers and sisters in Aotearoa New Zealand who have been affected by the recent earthquakes. May they receive the support and help they require in their time of need. Help us, Lord, to appreciate the good things we have and to seek in a spirit of service to be of help to our brothers and sisters. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, councillors, we will begin with public forum, but before we do, a uh, couple of things to note. The, we, our photographer will be taking some shots around the room, so if, um, if there's a lens uh, pointed at you from a distance, it's perfectly benign. <coughs> won't hurt anybody. Okay. And um, the other thing I just need to let you know that we won't have the screens on the wall uh, for the benefit of this, uh, being able to see resolutions today. There's something wrong technically, so we'll have to do it another way, but we'll, we'll manage. So, on to public forum, and can I invite Brooke Cox and Claudia Palmer of Oil Free Otago up, please. My name is Brooke Cox and I'm speaking on behalf of Oil Free Otago today. So it's the first time I've spoken at one of these things. Um, as you all know, the public are not permitted to formally oppose any of the oil and gas exploration process. So, is it, so this is it. And for me, after five years of a law and geography degree, educated using buzzwords like sustainability and resource management, Learning about all of this, from the science to the people to the politics, this is the stage as I'm nervously talking now. So we are relying on you, our local body representatives, to be the voices of reason and take a strong stand against deep sea drilling in your submission to block off a, the block offer process. I want to begin today by congratulating you all on your election. We all followed it very closely and we're really stoked to see you here today. Understandably, it's a long and tiring process, but alas, it is time to think about how you are going to be remembered as a council. Are you going to maintain the status quo or reinstate faith in local government? I know today for some of you, I'm preaching to the converted already, and I hope you feel supported by all free Otago today and others may be deemed a lost cause. But for new councillors today, or those of you on the fence, hear us. Today, I don't want to, dr to drill, oh, sorry. Today, I don't want to drill the effects of climate change. You've heard it all before, and I assume some of you have seen before the flood, just out recently. More soberingly, I also assume you keep the effects of last year's flood in South Dunedin in the forefront of your decision making. The IPCC report stress um, we must leave 80% of known fuel reserves in the ground to avoid catastrophic climate change. 
climate change that the WHO predicted from 2030 an extra 250,000 humans a year will lose their lives. We hear this kind of info all the time. Human lives are fast becoming a statistic. Deep sea oil is not on our government's agenda because they do not understand science. It is still on their agenda because they do not understand empathy. For too long, we have let people in power dictate what counts as a sensible submission against their senseless proposals. Econo economic arguments are the veil our leaders hide behind to avoid the moral implications of their decisions. Keeping emotions out of reasoning is a way of keeping ourselves emotionally insulated from the impacts of our behaviour. Western industrialised nations have to stop pretending that our industries and lifestyles aren't causing immense harm to humans and our ecosystems. We've let science describe climate change as a story of rising CO2 in the atmosphere, when it is as much as a story of capitalism, colonisation and exploitation. We will not be affected equally by this crisis. People's experience of climate change will depend on their race, gender and privilege, or lack of it. It will be a warm winter in Dunners for me, but to others, starvation. Sometimes I don't know which is more shocking, that one species could change the composition of an entire atmosphere, or that we know our habits are killing people and we still can't change them. We need to take responsibility for our community. We need to recognise that the 2016 block offer is an act of slow violence, fossil fuel extraction is an act of slow violence. Fossil fuel extraction exacerbates a crisis. Either we have a government who cannot conceptually link deep sea oil exploration with human impacts of climate change, or we have a government that can and are pushing ahead regardless. Either way, it is deeply concerning. It is your obligation to serve us. I respect all of you and your wisdom, your experience, but I urge you, follow in the footsteps of both Christchurch and Auckland councils who have blocked the offer. You have already divested from fossil fuel extraction on the Waipori Fund, and the University of Otago Foundation Trust has followed suit. Maintain the standard and continue the trend. The time is now, and we want a future to be proud of. To follow on what Brooke has said, I'd just like to finish with a point about necessity. Firstly, we've reached a point in development of technology that it is no longer necessary to, sorry, we've reached a point in development of technology where clean, renewable energy sources are both possible and sufficient ways in which we can sustain the needs of our community. Oil and gas are not necessary. Therefore, there is no need to support nor encourage the petroleum and mineral industries exploration endeavours. Secondly, given the facts that we have about climate change, it is now imminently necessary to cut these ties with oil and gas. According to a 2016 report by Oil Change International, existing reserves of oil and gas alone, even without coal, would be enough to breach the 1.5 degrees Celsius barrier set by the Paris Climate Agreement. Therefore, there is no reason for the petroleum and min mineral industry to do any further exploration. Finally, this fact of necessity that we must cease the, um, the use of oil and gas is a widely held concern. Um, not only do we have the universal legally binding Paris Climate Agreement, but we also have a worldwide climate movement of concerned citizens. 2015 saw record-breaking numbers um, of people turn up for climate marches across 175 countries. This year, tens of thousands of people took to the streets, occupied coal mines, and held community meetings across 13 countries to demand coal, oil, and gas stay in the ground. Dunedin included, we had the biggest turnout in New Zealand of locals protesting against ANZ's investments in fossil fuels. So, in summary, the use of oil and gas is not necessary, but it is necessary to stop. And it's clear that the demand is shifting and the use will soon become redundant. For these reasons, we urge you, the Council, to put forward a strong opposing submission to the government that calls on, on them to place a monitorium on all oil and gas exploration and extraction. And um, we need to align our actions on a national level with the expectations of the local and global community. 
And with your support, I am confident we will all be a witness to a clean energy future. Thank you. Are you happy to take questions? Yeah. Yep. Over chat. Questions, councillors? Are there any? Councillor Vanders. Thank you very much for that. You've said that even without coal, uh, safe CO2 levels will be breached with the oil and gas reserves that we already know of. <coughs> Do you recognise that coal, currently just in India alone, is accelerating its use at a rate that will eclipse any CO2 outputs from gas? I think we can debate a lot of economics and science and what is the state of the world and how we're going to find this future. And I don't, I will admit now, um, in terms of the figures, not educated enough. But we're saying it doesn't matter all these complexities, there is an opportunity for sustainable future and clean energies. We have all this technology, we want the demand now, the shift is starting, there's momentum, people are dying, it's literally moral imperative making these decisions if there are alternatives. So, yeah, there might be some coal around, but there are alternatives that we need to start putting money into and prioritise now. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> do you, do you recognise that the uh, CO2 and other noxious fumes from coal are far worse than what you would get from gas? What we've made in the statements is that any future uh, exploration of fuel, so we already have enough, there's no requirement for any further exploration. We've reached the limits, we cannot afford any further. So that's the end of the argument, really. Okay, so you don't recognise that, there's a, that, that, that burning gas is actually quite preferable in, in pollution terms to burning coal? That, we that don't, really we don't believe that. No, and okay. either either is not acceptable. It is, we have enough out, 80% will need to remain, that's already been found. It's not a matter of some being better or worse, because they're all bad. And right, we have but, the but you're not differentiating, that's fine, I just wanted to query that point, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Are we standing or sitting? Um, do you understand what the submission is about? The block off submission is about? Yes. In, in your eyes, what is it about? No, um, that's not a reasonable question. She's answered the question. Well, yes. your, your worship, the, the issue that I'm looking at here is that everything was about the drilling for oil, is what I repeatedly heard, where actually this is exploration permits. It's not about drilling. That's the next process down the line. So I'm trying to get an understanding. Everything I've heard today is all about how we shouldn't drill. And I'm sorry, that's not what the submission's on. Exploration um, commonly leads to the drilling process. If I, um, <laughs> yeah, and if I can repeat my points, I did um, conclude in both my um, points that it was about exploration endeavours. Um, they're not necessary um, because we already have enough in reserves to put us over, so there's no need to do any further exploration. We often thought um, in preparing these submissions that we wouldn't really be debating the fact that they are sort of bad. We know that 80% of our current discovered deposits, in order to stay within the 1.5 degree livable limit, 80% actually already have to stay on the ground. So the fact that we're debating either exploring or extracting you know, these little things we're saying, we've already got enough, there needs to be no exploration, whether it's gas or coal, and um, ours is more of a, you've now got a moral imperative as a council to think about the future, think about those people in South Dunedin, perhaps think about, you know, we might be high or mighty in our nice comfy seats, but a lot of people will be struggling, and it's up to us in our cushy seats to make these decisions. So this is a climate change debate, not a... Um submission on exploration. They're not scrupulously linked. Well. <laughs> the submission that we've got in front of us today is actually not a climate change debate or submission. It is a submission on exploration. Is that a okay. question? Yeah. 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 So so they So you're saying you can't foresee the consequences. You need to look down the line of the consequences well, that exploration, extraction, 
the government has a second process should an exploration want to undertake. No, we've blocked out of all of it, sir. The whole thing. Right. Well, uh, what we're debating here today. Councillor, so, you need to ask straight, just questions. This, this is not a place for a discussion. Okay. You talk about um, oil all the time. Where, what do you understand is off the coast of Otago based on the exploration to date? We're saying there shouldn't be any of it. It doesn't matter what we think the end result is. We're saying we have 80% 80 80 needs to stay within the ground. We need to stop exploring for oil and gas. It doesn't matter, you know, to what extent this discretion. We're saying here now, we, we want you to say no to the block offer. No to central <coughs> government saying this, this is... You, you as the local government have the responsibility to speak on behalf of us and say what we want. We are giving you this moral imperative to, to, to speak on behalf of us to the central government and you have the power to say no, like Auckland, like Christchurch, Auckland and Christchurch have just said that they're blocking the offers. So the offer is, that, to clarify for your purposes, they're going to put up this whole region of Otago um, up for exploration drilling, which to clarify for you, the exploration does lead to mining generally, because that's the dem demand, apparently. Um, and so we're saying now that we want you guys, as the, um, our representatives on Dunedin, to say to the central government, as people in Christchurch and Auckland have done, say no to the exploration, which inevitably leads to mining, which leads to fossil fuel, sorry, the extraction and the use and the burning, which destroys our planet. Industry. Okay, so when you look at coal and the greenhouse gases it emits versus gas that only takes 56%, or well, when you look at oil, there's only 71% of the emission factors versus coal, you don't believe it's a great transition fuel to get people off the coal and even off oil? So using gas as an alternative fuel is a stronger and better for the planet? No, we don't think it's necessary given that the um, technology is already here for um, cleaner alternatives. So if I don't support your views, then basically you're saying that uh, I won't be a voice of reason, you won't have faith in local government and that I'll be a lost cause? Very much so, sir. <laughs> well, the, uh, thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor O'Malley. Are you happy with the wording of the draft submission as it stands right now? We would like it to be strengthened, and that's something we could discuss. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's the, what we do. <laughs> but yeah, we very, uh, we're, we're happy with it, but we would like it to be strengthened. Okay. And what role do you think a council plays, given that, as you mentioned before, a lot of the public is excluded in this debate? What role do we play for you? Um, a very big role, and I think today we both um, just finished uni and have had a whole education of being, well, I've done law and geography and have learned about this process and this is the first time we've done it so sorry we're a bit nervous in that. But um, this is like the space that we've now come to and we're people that have done like environmental groups for a long time but this is all where our lecturers, you know, point us, the hegemonic structure we're meant to act within and I know so many of you put forward so many great submissions on the climate change but like, sorry it's the same luck, but this, this is the time and you guys have promised so a lot and South Dunedin is so close to us and we're trying to be connected, we're trying to use the right avenues, we're trying to block the haters because um, some people aren't actually worth engaging with um, and that's taken a lot of time for us to learn as young people. Um, but yeah, we're really trying and a lot of the faces that we see today, we've supported and we really hope, and like all of Otago is supporting you and we would love to help you strengthen the submissions. And this is what the future generations want. We want our children to see it. Thank you, Thank you very much for your submission and I know that it's uh, a big deal coming to the public forum. My question is, how would you like to see our submission strengthened? I think... Um, we, to be honest, we haven't... Um, well, the moratorium just needs to be across all of New Zealand. We need to send a clear message to the 
um, central government that there's they really shouldn't be even putting up a block offer. Yeah. So an overt. I don't know. I think there's potential more discussion, but I think there's potential to link up with the Christchurch and Auckland <laughs> councils already. A bit of collaboration between Oil Free Otago and other oil free <coughs> networks to really create a collaborative effort. And I think. That was so ex what was so exciting about this local body elections and being old enough sort of to get involved is hearing about the strength and power of you guys and the fact that actually, you know, you've got such a role in comparison to central government and imagine if you could really network, you know, f through us, people that are interested, really network together to create a nationwide sort of campaign against it. Because, um, you know, there has been notoriously strong areas like Otago but you guys, you've already set the lead, you know, or well, not mm. the lead, but, you know, with your Waipori Fund and the University of Otago, you know, and what we were trying to say earlier, you know, there's all this, it's exhausting how much intellectual academic information has been poured and poured into this, but no one's doing, you know, it's me and Claudia here asking you guys, now it's your go, your go, but we're happy to help and we would help and we would make it stronger and we can communicate with other councils. I think that we live at such an exciting time, but your nice seats are nice, but you can make the decisions. Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? There are none. Thank you for your submission. Thank you. Um, the next um, submitter is speaking on the same subject. It's Charlie Montague of 350 Dunedin. Charlie Montague and I'm speaking on behalf of 350 here in Dunedin and on behalf of myself as a Dunedin human who lives in South Dunedin. I was a beach babe from the very beginning, having my first holiday to the family batch when I was only three weeks old. We had a huge Pahutakawa tree that took up most of our section and Dad upgraded a shed into a funky 80s beach house. When we slept, there were surfboards on racks above us. If you stayed really still, you could hear the waves break, smell the salt of the ocean. Every summer we go back there, and I think that's a luxury quite a few New Zealanders have. I remember being about seven and learning about private beaches overseas where you got these fenced off portions of space. I thought this was nuts. Mum told me it was the French. So I thought the French were nuts. How could any one group of people decide who gets to enjoy a public space like a beach? No matter what happens these days, I can go to the beach and take a deep breath and feel like things will be okay. An ocean reminds me how small I am, right? How tiny my impacts are. And then suddenly I'm at a coffee with my friends. We finished our last exam and we're talking about wanting to travel around Kerala when someone interrupts. The new block offer is out, and over 400,000 square kilometres of ocean are up for offer. Oil and gas companies are allowed by our government to bring their machines into our shared oceans and try to take whatever they can get. It's hard to explain the sinking feeling I got hearing this, knowing New Zealanders are actively exploiting our oceans. I watched the clean-up after Rena, and I never ever want to have to say to some kid I'm babysitting, no, we can't go to the beach today. It's dangerous. It sucks enough seeing a dead seabird on the shore every now and again. Imagine seeing one soaked in oil and knowing it's suffocated. The smell of oil and rotting wildlife is not a perfume we want here in Dunedin. The feel of grease on our gloves. You are all empathetic, passionate people. You wouldn't be in this room if you weren't. None of you want to have to shout at a kid and say, don't touch that, as they reach towards toxic sand on our shores. We can't let one group of people make a choice that can result in impacting how thousands of us use the beach. Saying we need oil is false. The ingenuity and creativity of humans is helping us move beyond fossil fuels right now. Sure, we used them and they were valuable, but just like we moved on from scrolls to books, we can move on and transition to renewables. 
What we lack is the political pressure. You know the economic, you know the scientific and moral implications of anything less than a complete ban, full moratorium on this process. You know that if you let oil and gas companies in, you'll be a part of a generation who has to either lie or explain to our grandkids that we knew about climate change and we chose to ignore it. Some politicians here in New Zealand believe New Zealand's too small to make a difference. I challenge them to take that belief to the All Blacks or Surrey's family. Too small to make a difference is defeatist, and New Zealand is anything but. This is a question of your integrity as individuals and commitment to the shared earth we call home. This is your commitment to your children and grandchildren. When you ask for a ban on deep sea drilling here in all of Aotearoa, you show that you are trusted politicians who listen. Andrew Wiley and friends, the industry spokesman in the room and obvious conflict of interest, may try to convince you that gas is green. It's important we are all on the same page, that gas is a fossil fuel contributing to climate change, causing the deaths of animals, the hunger of millions of people, and rapidly spreading malaria. Wiley is afraid. His industry is losing grip, and I get it, that is sad. But for now, denial in a space like this is unsafe and improper. I love this incredible land. I love our community, and I love that we're brave enough to stand up for what is right. It's, it's not easy. The submission last year was really good. In the wake of ratifying the Paris climate deal, we must step it up. The consequences of this oil drilling may benefit a few councillors here, but they will not benefit normal people and will in fact contribute to an increasingly unsafe, unhealthy world. We know who cleans up after these oil spills. It's our community whose tourism will be impacted, ours, and whose 100% clean green image could drown along with a whole lot of our special marine life. The solution to both the ecological and climate challenges of this block offer is easy. We say no to the block offer and create a moratorium on oil and gas exploration and extraction in all New Zealand waters. Dunedin Council can use our voice to pressure the central government to get that outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, <laughs> questions, councillors? There are none. Oh, thank you. The next submitter to our public forum is uh, uh, Donna Peacock and Sister Noreen McGrath. Welcome. And you'll be speaking, members of the Dunedin Catholic community, speaking on the same subject. Welcome. Tinakoja <coughs> Katoa. <coughs> Called Donna Peacock Aho, my sister Noreen McGrath Tene. Uh, we speak as members of our Catholic community following the call of our Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, caring for our home, common home, in which he called on all peoples of the earth to come together to protect the gift of creation, our sister earth, and our common home. In chapter 6, Francis says, Many things have to change course, but as we humans who it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, or of our mutual belonging, and of a future to be shared with everyone. This basic awareness would enable the development of new convictions, attitudes and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual and educational challenge stands before us and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. Firstly, we would like to recognise and thank the Council for its commitment to withdraw all investments from fossil fuels, armaments and other harmful commodities. Secondly, we wish to th thank the Council for calling on for public submissions on the 2016 block offer last year. Prior to this, 320 people attended the government's target consultation meeting in Dunedin, which demonstrates our concern and commitment to transition. 
New Zealand is to be congratulated on ratifying the Paris Climate Agreement. We now have the responsibility to live into what that contains. We urgently need a time and action plan to secure all targets by 2030 and zero emissions by 2050, as promised our children. This means no fossil fuels or oil and gas exploration. When we speak of new technology, that brings to mind some photographs, both of a same busy street in New York, one in 1903, where among the horses one could barely detect a car. The new technology. Move on 10 years, 1913, the same scene, and one could barely detect a horse among the cars. Ten, to, ten years that took. Now our world is on the verge of a new revolution with the same benefits which can be gained with a new technology but powered directly by nature, the sun, wind and oceans. Pope Francis reminds us that the Earth Charter asked us to leave behind a period of self-destruction and make a new start. But, he says, we have not as yet developed a universal awareness needed to achieve this. Now is the time we are at a critical ethics of ecology to engage. We have the capacity and wisdom to survive and to do it well. And now, um, caring for our common home has a constant theme of interconnectedness of everything. And now some quotes from Francis as they apply to our present decision. So, we cannot fail to consider the effects on people's lives of environmental deterioration, current models of development, and the throwaway culture. Less is more. Our relationship with the environment can never be isolated from our relationship with others and with God. We need to strengthen the conviction that we are one single human family. There are no frontiers or barriers, political or social, which we can hide, behind which we can hide. Still less is there room for the globalisation of indifference. If everything is related, then the health of a society's institutions has consequences for the environment and the quality of human life. Nobody is suggesting we return to the Stone Age, but we do need to slow down and look at the reality, look at reality in a different way. To recover the values and the great goals swept away by our unrestrained illusions of grandeur. The spirit of life dwells in every living creature and calls on us to enter into a relationship with it. And here in Aotearoa, Tangata Whenua would say, Tihe Māori ora, behold the spirit of life. We are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. The notion of the common good also extends to future generations. We can no longer speak of sustainable development apart from intergenerational solidarity. Global independence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan. An awareness of the gravity of today's cultural and ecological crisis must be translated into new habits. Here, he says, I would echo the courageous challenge of the Earth Charter. As never before in history, common destiny beckons us to seek a new beginning. Let ours be the time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life and the firm resolve to achieve sustainability. The quickening of the struggle for justice and peace and the joyful celebration of life. And that statement is now 15 years old, at least. In conclusion, in keeping with Francis' call to all mankind and interconnectedness of all creation and the need for intergenerational justice, we implore you as our council to show wisdom and integrity and keep faith with all of us by strongly opposing the 2017 block offer. Our children will later assess decisions made here today. And the last word comes from Francis. We are at a crossroads. Whether we like it or not, we have a decision and action to take without delay. Let us sing as we go. May our struggles and our concern for this planet never take away the joy of our hope. Thank you for your time. Kia ora.
Councillors, do you have any questions? Our next um, speaker is Lyndon Weggery, who wishes to speak to us about Aurora Delta. Welcome, Lyndon. Five minutes is yours. Um, can I request you and George would just wait until everybody gets a copy? Is that right? No, no far away. Sure. Um, just while the copies, uh, Count Mayor and Councillors, are coming around uh, by Pam Jordan, um, I've taken the honour and respect of giving the Mayor and the three co sponsors of the notice of motion a bit more attachments. The rest of you, not don't feel neglected, yours are just attachments that will refer to the pages that I highlight um, in, in my submission. So that's the reason for some getting thin ones and some getting thick ones. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for this opportunity to address you concerning agenda item number 12. My thanks to those councillors who have promoted this notice of motion because it highlights the concern that many Dunedin residents and ratepayers with the overall condition of our local power supply network. This concern in simple terms to us, I believe, is the question how does DCHL give insurance to the DCC that there will be no major power blackouts in the city arising from what we all know is an ageing network. I recall that we are still seeking a similar insurance from Council that there will be no more flooding of South Dunedin properties as long as the stormwater infrastructure has been upgraded to reasonably cope with future events. As power consumers, you all know we all pay faithfully our line charges in good faith, but because Aurora is a lines company owned by us, the Eden City Council, it is starting to rankle with many citizen ratepayers that our money appears to be siphoned off from core business functions into other areas. The annual net subvention payment of approximately net $5 million from Aurora Energy to DVL is, you'll agree, a case in point. Sadly, the late Richard Wall's vision of dividends coming back to council from our many council companies to offset rates is, I understand, no more. The state of our power poles have received wide publicity thanks to the ODT. But it is the wider network as well that I wish to draw your attention to as outlined in Aurora's 185-page Asset Management Plan 2016 that has recently been endorsed by the board. In case you haven't seen it, I've enclosed extra copies of some relevant pages in which you'll agree, I'm sure, interesting facts have been highlighted. Take, for example, page 59. As of December 2015, they say, there are 991 condition zero and 1,130 condition one poles which require some form of intervention for the next 12 months. You will note that Delta are not subject to the three or 12 months deadline under the Energy Safety Regulations 2010 because they have an audited <coughs> safety management system in place. But I also understand that WorkSafe are coming down on the 22nd of November to review their, their safety practices, that is Delta. Take a look at page 62, and I quote, Many zone substations in Dunedin are housed in buildings that are up to 70 years old. Another quote from the same page, perhaps the most significant risk of catastrophic asset failure relates to our remaining 33 volt gas field cables. Look at page 71. Storm, flooding, earthquake and high winds are our major natural disaster risks. 
page 79, the current rate of discovery of condition zero poles amongst those poles previously to be greater than zero is around 15%, they claim. This is high, they admit, compared to industry averages, which typically range from 5 to 12%. But did you know, Your Worship and councillors, that according to a recent survey before the earthquake of two days ago, of 29 line companies by the Electricity Networks Association, wait for it, Delta has 1181 condition zero power poles, while the rest of the country has only 321 in total. What an embarrassing figure for us to wear. Page 95, the impact of old, older coastal overhead infrastructure is evident in the lower condition grading on Dunedin. Page 96, while there are some indications that our 33 and 66 kV lines, particularly in Dunedin, are aging, actual line failures are extremely rare, thank goodness. As a result, and this is a surprise to me, our current strategy is to fix on failure to fix on failure. Page 98, historically there has been little or no investment in the LV network, which has led to heightened concerns about potential safety risks. Page 142, it is expected that most of the equipment at Anderson's Bay substation will be at the end of its economic life in 2019. So it's proposed that the substation be upgraded with new transformers and switchgear at this time. Page 162, with many of the Aurora assets either well into the second half of their design life or approaching the end of their design life, additional provision for a neural expenditure has been made across a number of asset classes, refined through consideration of condition and asset health, whatever that means. And then here's the crunch, page 173. Under key challenges, note these words. And the key challenges that need to be addressed. And notice the order. First of all, achieving adequate shareholder returns whilst meeting the needs of the community for reliable, secure energy in both high-density urban and low-density rural areas. Councillors and Your Worship, I'm old enough and long enough in Dunedin to know that when we had DEL, that those would have been reversed. There would have been the need for reliable, secure energy well above achieving adequate shareholder returns. That's how bad we've come. Aging plant. Many of our assets are now entering the second half of their design life. While we have a planned refurbishment replacement program detailed in the AMP, the purpose of maintenance is to care for these assets in a manner, wait for it, that extracts the maximum value now and in the future. I guess that ties in with their fix on failure strategy. Your Worship the Mayor and Councillors, in the light of the above revelations, I urge you all to fully debate this motion today and trust that you will unanimously support it as a first step on behalf of the citizens of Dunedin. I've signed this obviously with my name and given my address, and you'll note that I've got a personal interest, because I am too worried about a power pole opposite our property in Middleton Road which is a condition one red tag, even with a serial number affixed to it. And my inquiries from Delta show they have no indication to me over the phone when it will be fixed. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr Wigry. Questions, councillors? No, there are no questions. Thank you, Mr. Cheers. Our final... Um, Speaker today is Catherine Spencer of the Urban Co of Urban Co Housing Otipoti Limited, uh, speaking about the High Street Co Housing Project. Welcome. My name is Catherine Spencer and I'm one of the directors of Urban Co-Housing Autoporti Limited and this is Francis Ross um, who is one of my co-housing uh, neighbours and she will also be speaking part way through uh, my five minute um, call. 
So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about the DCC's potential investment in the High Street co-housing project as a social housing provider. Early on in the project, our group committed to having social housing as part of our neighbourhood. This was in order to increase uh, diversity and robustness of the community by making the co-housing experience available to those who are unable to buy into the project. We've been in discussions with the Council for over 12 months and it is now critical for our final stages before construction to have your commitment confirmed one way or the other as we raise finance with banks and pre-sell the rest of the units. All the units need to be spoken for before the banks will entertain loaning to us. I don't want to go into the details about the advantages of passive house design and a co-housing neighbourhood. I have just circulated an article, which some of you may have seen, about the advantages of having social housing at a standard of passive house design and the economic uh, health, mental health and other advantages of this. I won't go into that at this point. Um, but I would like to take some of this time um, to correct some of the things that came out in the report um, that I think need to be clarified for you to make a good decision. And one of them is the notion that a council or council representative needs to turn up to all our UCOL meetings and once it's uh, built to our body court meetings. This, I can assure you, is not the case. Your tenants would need to commit to those meetings, as does anyone else who lives in the co-housing neighbourhood. And also, we would run the induction process for any new and incoming tenants, just as we do for anybody who's contemplating buying in. And this will be an ongoing process as the uh, people live there and then their circumstances change and they need to sell up. We need to then run those induction processes to make sure that whoever comes to live in the co-housing uh, neighbourhood, it is the right fit from both uh, sides. So we'll take that responsibility. So I'm going to just pass over to Francis, um, who is going to illuminate you on a few other points before I carry on to a second point. Thank you, Catherine. I just have two points. The first one relates to a statement on page 25 um, under potential for co-housing cooperative to want to vet prospective tenants. Um, in our process, there is, in fact, no vetting process. Potential members are asked to sign the organising agreement and the covenant on the title. That's all prospective members. And that ensures that they agree with the principles of co-housing as per our resource consent. They are also asked to sign a declaration that they have not been convicted of any crimes relating to the <coughs> exploitation or abuse of children. The second point that I'd like to speak to is on page 31 of your um, notes. And this relates to um, concerns about ongoing body corp fees in a co-housing development and how this might affect you. Um, as a unit development, owners will pay a share of body corp fees in accordance with the size of the unit purchase. For the Body Corp operational account, these fees will cover rates for the common areas, insurance of each unit and the common house, ongoing maintenance of buildings, electricity for the common house and a modest administrative charge. Rates for the individual units are paid directly to the DCC by the unit owner. When all of these proportional Body Corp costs were added up, and rates were included, the share was less than most people are paying now for their standalone houses. 
There will also be a body corp development fund and each share will again be proportional to the value of the unit purchaser. But this will not be a large expense as a number of our current members are not in a position to pay large additional sums on an annual basis. Also, unlike most apartment buildings with shared grounds, the ground maintenance and garden development at High Street Co-Housing will be done by enthusiastic unit owners. Thank you. I will now move on to my final point. We've offered you two two-bedroom units and one five-bedroom unit. And our thinking behind offering you the five-bedroom unit was that as Dunedin has been designated a refugee resettlement city, and while we understand your social housing commitment <coughs> is ordinarily for people over 55 years old um, for one and two bedroom units, we believe that a co-housing neighbourhood for a f family from Syria or elsewhere, which is warm and dry and requires little additional outgoings, would make an ideal place for integration into a new country, city and lifestyle. Since we offered you those three units, as a result of our ongoing induction processes, we have had more people wanting to be part of the project. There is now an oversubscription for the two bedroom units. We do still, however, have two three bedroom units which hadn't initially been offered to you, but which might fit the refugee idea and your budget better than the four to five bedroom unit. We will be holding all three units offered for you, but we'll have to turn away at least one couple if we can't accommodate them as it looks likely, unless we can come to some other arrangement. We understand your stock priorities are for the one and two bedroom units, but I did want to just reiterate why we put to you uh, the background for the refugee larger unit. So we hope that you find this an exciting, innovative model to invest in, which addresses the city's spatial plan, its second generation plan, the designated refugee resettlement city, as well as your social housing needs. And alongside this, you would be supporting the co-housing project to become reality. Despite the huge difficulties we have had and encountered on the way, simply because it is a different housing model and that is always challenging. Francis and I are happy to take any questions. Questions, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, and thank you for. Uh, coming and speaking to us. I've got a couple of questions um, because it wasn't included in the paper. It would be good to get an idea of what the rough water cost are, is for the three bedroom units. Um, you don't need to, I mean, you can do that now or circulate it however mm -hmm. is easiest. Um, and my second question is um, I mean, personally, I'm a little confused and others might be too around what the expectation is for tenants in terms of the communal aspects. Uh, of the co-housing project, whether they're expected to cook for the collective once a week or do, a, do collective laundry or, as you say, uh, maybe they've got greener fingers. But um, is it a flexible thing or is it a prescriptive thing and just, just what are we signing ourselves up for in that regard? Okay, so anyone who lives here, it is a very flexible thing. One of the reasons co-housing works and it is widespread in North America and Northern Europe is that it respects and sets up two very different spaces. It respects the private, so everybody has their own regular private unit. It has a full kitchen, bathroom and other rooms that you need in a house, but there are also common facilities housed in the common house alongside the common grounds. And how we use that depends on how we choose to do our day-to-day -day living in that space. So anybody who's part of the co-housing neighbourhood 
does need to sign up to the ethos of co-housing as per our resource consent and our organising agreements. Um, but the, we, we also recognise there are times people do need to withdraw and not be so heavily involved. Um, and so any tenants, whether they be your tenants or whether they be an investor's tenants, needs to participate in that community. And they have just as much voice at the table as anybody who is an owner-occupier. So we run in a very uh, fair consensus decision-making forum, but the nitty-gritty of how many meals a week will be offered to the community and whether you choose individually to eat um, with those, we haven't nutted out. We've been um, focusing on some of the big legal issues and the building project as it is. So those are things that those who are coming on to the project actually help uh, drive the decisions uh, that we make as a group. Councillor Benson Park. Um, thank, you. thank you for your presentation. At the time of the consent, you were considering staging the development according to their demand and so on. Is that no longer the case? Have you got such subscription levels that you can do it all pretty much at once? Uh, staging the consent was actually never really an option for us. It was obviously something we looked at, but it makes it actually very expensive, especially for the first, um, because it's quite a small site, um, and also because those who were already part of it weren't all going to be housed in one of the blocks. Okay. Um, and further to that then, that thinks that's quite clear, um, is the, c the configuration finalised or is the, is the sort of number of threes and twos and larger yeah. units sort of illusory or conceptual yeah. at the moment yeah. or are you way past that stage? No, we're just about to apply for building consent. So we did um, have a quick discussion at our last meeting as to whether there was a possibility of including another two bedroom and one bedroom unit by dividing the five bedroom one but because of the fire regulations between um, horizontal living um, that is not really uh, on the cards. So the two two-bedroom units that we have offered, I also <coughs> wanted to include, one is, um, on, is horizontal living, so on the ground floor, and the other one is on the second and third, and spread over the second and third floors. So that may also be a consideration for you. And we're, and we're happy to um, yeah, talk further about that. I can circulate um, the draft costs, but the three-bedroom unit um, is five hundred and forty thousand thereabouts. But our our prices um, aren't yet quite locked in. We're doing our best. Councillor Mayor, thanks very much for your presentation. I noticed you said that you are oversubscribed on the two bedroom units. Mm -hmm. um, so, does that include the offer to us in that? Um... We, we have a firm commitment first to social housing. Um, and so, as I said, we will hold those units for you. Um, but we would like to see if there is any possibility of further conversation about um, your choices. So, so you're holding them based on the commitment to social housing rather than the need to find tenants to fill in those spaces? Uh, to find buyers. Yeah, um, yeah, buyers. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's all of these things as we work through them are negotiable. negotiable. Um, but certainly because we've made that offer, because we've had a very early on commitment to social housing, um, those units are available, but it does sadly mean that we certainly will be saying goodbye to one household who, and as I said, our need is to get them all sold. So I think there are ways forward, but it just depends on um, whether we can have a further conversation or whether that's not possible from your point of view, and I understand your constraints. And um, the sense of needing to find out at this meeting whether or not we're going to commit ourselves to this investment as it relates to you seeking financing. Could you explain that a little bit more as to what our role is and why you need that from us today, Morris? Okay, so we are negotiating um, with banks. Um, there are very few in which we can, and basically we need to be able to take um, our pre-unconditional 
purchase and sale agreements for all units to the bank in order to have some leverage to raise the remaining finance. So we show them what we have already committed to the project, any other cash reserves that we can put towards that project. Banks are willing to loan only up to about 60%. Um, so we need to be in as strong a financial position um, in order to be able to negotiate with banks. And you may well be aware of that there have been developments in Auckland that have not gone ahead because the banks um, are pulling back from unit developments and apartment developments. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. Um, just a question really, I guess, about how specific you need our support to be at this meeting um, and whether it would still be useful were council of a mind to commit to buying X number of units without spe specifying the size of them at this stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just say that because, I mean, we've heard now there are other options, three bedroom mm -hmm. units that we haven't had a chance really to consider. Um, and uh, our next meeting is on the 6th of December, so we do meet again before Christmas. Just mm -hmm. in terms of your timelines, whether that will be helpful or completely counterproductive were we to uh, head in that direction? That would be extremely helpful if you could commit in principle to an X number of units. That would be great. Yeah. Now, today. But can I follow up that question by asking if it would be more helpful if we specified which units today? If you're able to, given that I realise that I have put new information on, on the table that you may need to take some further time to consider. Um, but we will work with you whatever you decide. Um, I think because it will be coming up to Christmas and because the negotiations with the bank won't happen overnight, that if you made a decision in principle to take an X number of units, um, then we could work, do the other work around within that month and then you confirm um, on the 16th of December which particular units. Are there further questions? Councillor Stedman. Uh, thank you. Um, just, um, you say you're oversubscribed um, and you've asked us, you've come back to us because we've had an understanding in the past. If the council didn't get involved, would the project still go forward, um, or is it just that the council provides a bit more strength to the project for the banks? The council certainly provides more strength to the banks, and also if you were part of it as social housing, it would enable the, the community to be more diverse, and we are looking at longevity and robustness of our community. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Wiley. Sorry, but just following up on that. So if the council had the mind to, say, just agree to one unit, it would have the same bearing as if they committed to two units? Uh, we think from the point of view of uh, your tenants and for the community, it would be much better to have at least two units as social housing rather than one simple isolated social housing unit. Um, certainly the minimum being two. We'd love to have three on board, but um, that is obviously your prerogative. Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I'd just like to clarify the, uh, clarify the answer you gave Councillor Benson Pope. Was it your, what you meant was that you couldn't, even though you're oversubscribed on two bedrooms, you couldn't change the plan and take the five bedrooms and build two more two bedroom units? That was your That's answer. correct. Yeah, the other question I have is, so I'm not sure how this works with you as a director. Does that mean you are a director as an owner of some of the units or would be an owner, or, and then you would rent them out, or you would actually own them and live in them? Uh, what happens is that the, counts, uh, the, the company is simply the vehicle in order to get this development built. And those of us who are directors and shareholders in the company all expect to buy in to the co-housing uh, neighbourhood. We would then owner occupy those units that um, we will be inhabiting. And if the DCC was of a mind to get involved, would you see that we would 
pay the minimum amount and then raise the rest to a loan, or would you see that we would pay outright and we would have no debt in the company? Uh, that would, oh, you, oh, so post construction, you're talking about post okay. settlement, that you would have no debt in the company because we expect the company will be wound up once the project is built, um, and then the body corp that we are legally obliged to have for a unit title development um, will take over the day-to-day -day running of the community. And the individual units may or may not have mortgages? Yes, yes. Councillor okay. Vanderbus. The company that you represent, is it a limited liability company? Yes. The number of units that you have planned, how many of them, what percentage of them, do you already have unconditional sales on? We're finalising our purchase and sale agreement as we speak. Um, so at the moment, nobody has signed that agreement, um, but we have uh, 19 spoken for. Out of? Out of. We're planning at this stage, um, we have resource consent for 26. We think we'll probably be doing 22, so taking it back a little bit. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? So the 19 includes three for the DCC. There are no further questions. Francis, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. OK, councillors, that's the uh, conclusion of public forum. Um, you, as you'll be aware, or it may not be, if you're new, the, we usually indicate how um, we intend to respond to submissions to public forum. I note that in this instance, the subject matter of all of the uh, submissions is actually on the agenda today. So it will be dealt with, all of those will be dealt with at this meeting today.